All right, welcome back to our second lecture in Module 8. We're continuing our discussions of logic, critical thinking, and uh, different types of reasoning. Uh, we're going to pick up and now talk about conditional reasoning. We talked last time about syllogistic reasoning. Conditional reasoning is a little bit different. certainly has, um, I believe, a little bit more application, and we'll see uh, some empirical studies of conditional reasoning towards the end of the lecture. But first, we'll set up sort of what a conditional reasoning problem looks like, and then look at some different issues. So a conditional reasoning uh, problem usually involves a logical determination of, of whether the evidence supports, refutes, or is irrelevant to a stated relationships. These are usually stated as if-then relationships. The, antece <laughs> the antecedent is the if, and the consequent is the then. So it's something like, if I am a freshman, then I have to register today. So the antecedent is if I'm a freshman. The consequent is, then I have to register today. So the consequent is what is the consequence to think of if you fulfill the antecedent, the if. So we can affirm or deny a proposition based on the antecedent or the consequence. Consequent, sorry. Um, which leaves us with four possibilities based on the available evidence, affirming or denying the consequent, affirming or denying the antecedent. Two of these provide us with logical um, conclusions. So affirming the antecedent, denying the antecedent, so I'm a freshman, I'm not a freshman. Affirming the consequent, I have to register today, and denying the consequent, I don't have to register today. So it looks something like this. Um, there are formal names for affirming the uh, antecedent and denying the consequent, um, which I will never ask you to know, um, but modus ponens and modus tollens. Um, these are the two which you can provide a logical inference from. So, uh, I am a freshman is affirming the antecedent if I am a freshman, which means we have to logically conclude that you have to register today. Now. If you're not a freshman, we don't know if you have to register or not. We don't know anything about freshmen, uh, anybody who are not freshmen. It might be freshmen and seniors have to register today. We don't know. So if uh, our evidence is that a person is not a freshman, we have no idea whether or not they have to register today or not. Uh, affirming the consequent, um, I have to register today. Well, they might be a freshman. They might not. They might be a senior. They might be something else. Uh, finally, uh, I do not have to register today denying the consequent, now we can make a logic inference, logical inference, because we know freshmen have to register today, so if someone does not have to register today, then that means they're not a freshman. So we'll go through these uh, a little bit at a time, um, just to kind of reinforce what I was just saying. So affirming the antecedent, if I'm a freshman, we have a logical inference that they have to register today. If we're denying the antecedent, I'm not a freshman, that's our evidence. Remember, the if I'm a freshman, I have to register today is set up as um, sort of a rule, and we have to decide whether or not something fits the rule or not. Um, this person's not a freshman. We have no idea whether or not they have to register today, so we cannot validly infer that they do not have to register today. Similarly, somebody who has to register today we don't know if they're freshmen, we don't know if they're sophomores, juniors, seniors. The only thing we know about from this rule is freshmen. So keep that in mind. So can't make any valid inferences based on affirming the consequent. Denying the consequent, I do not have to register today. Well, now we can say we know this isn't a freshman because freshmen have to register today. So these kinds of logical statements and the evidence that we have uh, to compare them to become important because this is a big part of how scientific theory works, how scientific reasoning works, um, and how we uh, make valid conclusions based on uh, this kind of logical if-then statement. So here's a summary. If we can affirm the antecedent and deny the consequent, those are the two ways in which we can make valid inferences. This becomes important because it tells us the kind of information we have to gather in an applied situation. Um, so we want to make sure we can affirm the antecedent and deny the consequent. So um, this is called the Wasson card problem. If a card has a vowel on one side, then it has an even number on the other side. Right? So we're presented with these four cards. 
which ones do we turn over? Well, the first thing we have to say is if a card has a vowel on one side, so we'll turn the E over. About 33% of participants thought only to turn the E over because they only saw that affirming evidence. It's called confirmation bias. Now, the question is, what other card do we turn over to determine whether or not this rule is true? Well, if a card has a vowel on one side, then it has an even number on the other side, what we need to do is deny the um, consequent, actually. Uh, I don't know why this is denying the antecedent, it's denying the consequent. So if it has an odd number on the other side, so for example, if we flip this over, again, uh, and there's a vowel on it, then we know that it's not true. Um, whereas if we flip the four over and it has a vowel on the other side, um, we haven't been able to find any disconfirming evidence. So it's the disconfirming evidence that we often look for. Only 4% of uh, participants in this study thought to look for that disconfirming evidence. And again, this is called confirmation bias. Uh, so they went back to the drawing board and came up with uh, a postage cheaters example. Subjects, was the subjects were told to find cheaters of a postal regulation in which only unsealed envelopes could be mailed with a cheaper stamp. So we have these four envelopes. Which do we check? Well, 87% of subjects made both correct choices. So obviously we will determine um, whether or not someone's cheating by flipping over the sealed envelope to see if it has the cheaper stamp, and then we'll feel, flip over the cheaper stamp to see if um, it has uh, been sealed or not. And that concreteness is what determines it, because if they put the more expensive stamp on this unsealed envelope, we don't care. They're not cheating, they're just not being smart. And the same thing with this more expensive stamp, we don't care about that. So we check the cheaper stamp, and we check the sealed envelope. And so it's uh, that kind of social motivation to catch a cheater that seems to uh, led, have led participants to that, uh, getting to that uh, logical conclusion. Uh, so to summarize, we can use uh, this kind of logical inference to try to figure out how to test hypotheses. And so that's why this is so important for science, because essentially the hypothesis here, let's go back to the card, um, back up just a second. If we're talking about a hypothesis, um, we want to look for confirming evidence and for disconfirming evidence, and that's what we do in science. We oftentimes look for ways in which we can disconfirm a scientific theory. So keep that in mind, that this way in which we can use this logical Oh, God damn. Let's see. Have you been recording this yet?